compressed tracks, deep powder, and unspoiled views that beckon you at your front door. All you need is a pair of snowshoes. Join us in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho as we hike from Galena Summit to the headwaters of the Salmon River and make our own adventure on Trailside. Trailside is brought to you by Chevy Tahoe, encouraging you to find your own little part of the planet. If you can walk, you can snowshoe. Sounds simple, but complexities do arise, not in your technique, but in your decision of where to go next. In the Sawtooth Mountains, they don't make it easy on you. Three mountain ranges converge in this area with peaks that soar up to 12,000 feet. National Forest meets designated wilderness area and includes the largest roadless stretch in the lower 48 states. It's only accessible by ski or snowshoe in the winter, and chances are, the only other people you'll see out here are those you brought with you. Joe St. Ange and I spent the night at Boulder Yurt after a long day of great backcountry skiing. Today I'm meeting up with his wife, Francie St. Ange. I'll be swapping my skis for snowshoes and heading out once more into the Sawtooth Wilderness. Francie St. Ange is a guide and co-owner of Sun Valley Trekking. She's led expeditions throughout the West and Alaska. Good morning, Francie. Morning, Brian. How are your legs feeling after yesterday? Oh, I felt muscles I haven't felt in years, but I did some stretching this morning, so I should be okay. Great, that's always a good idea. So what do you have in store for us today? Well, today we're gonna go even further out into the backcountry. We're gonna see some of the most pristine wilderness in the lower 48. Our tour is gonna take us through a series of life zones as we make our descent. We're starting up here in the Alpine Zone on Galena Summit, and then we're gonna head down into the Subalpine Zone and down into the Sawtooth Valley, which is the Montane Zone. We're gonna finish our tour at the headwaters of the Salmon River. Is that a pretty big river? The Salmon River is a really big river. The headwaters are pretty small, though. So small, you could actually jump across it. Is that right? So are the headwaters still in the Sawtooth National Forest? Yeah, we're going to be on the Sawtooth National Recreation Area all day today. Do we need a permit for that? Nope, no permit needed. We're on public land. However, whenever you go out, it's always a really good idea to let somebody know where you're going and what time you expect to get back. And then once you do get back, you can give those folks a call and let them know that you made it home safely. Yeah, that's always a good idea. So what are we gonna need for our hike today? Well, we're only going out for a couple hours and it's a beautiful day, but the weather can change in the mountains at any time, so it's always a good idea to be prepared for anything. Let's go take a look at our packs and see if we've got everything we need. Okay. Francie, I swapped out my large pack for just a day pack. I hope that's okay. Oh yeah, that's great. Now what I brought with me was uh, some extra layers, some avalanche gear, shovel, and space blanket, uh, extra socks. I've got also some oranges for energy, mag light, sunglasses, water for hydration, and I'm wearing my transceiver. Oh, great, Brian. Yeah, the avalanche equipment's gonna be really important. In the unlikely event, if you were to be swept away in an avalanche and buried, I'd be able to find you with my avalanche transceiver. I'd be able to pinpoint your location with the avalanche probe, and I'd be able to dig you out with our shovel here. So, it's really important to have this stuff with you. Um, the most important thing, though, is to keep ourselves out of that situation, if at all possible. And so for that, I have a slope meter. See, avalanches only occur on slopes between 20 degrees and 60 degrees, so we can use this slope meter to determine whether we're in avalanche terrain or not, and then take the ne necessary precautions if we are. So some other things I always bring are our map and compass to keep us oriented and on track. I always carry some snacks, sunscreen. The sun's pretty intense up here at altitude. I always carry my first aid kit and some water. You'll see I've got some drink mix in my water bottle. It helps me drink more if it tastes good. Oh, sure, yeah. And then I'll also bring a down jacket, which is a really good emergency layer in case we do have to sit out in the snow for some time. Okay. Well, I just, I'm just wearing standard hiking boots, and I, I found an overshoe to go over them with a the gaiter. I hope that's going to be okay. Oh, yeah, this is a great design. I love these over boots. And with the hiking boot, the most important thing is just that the hiking boot comes up real high over your ankles. You want a comfortable footbed in there to get some uh, arch support, too. So I think 
That's all we need to carry. I think we've got one more really important piece of equipment, though. The snowshoes. Yeah, let's go see our snowshoes. All right. Well, here's a variety of the different kind of snowshoes, Brian, and check this out. Look at these old traditional snowshoes. Aren't they gorgeous? Oh, yeah. They're made out of wood and rawhide. And some serious snowshoers still use this style. However, most people are starting to go over to the more modern metal snowshoes. Now, was this the first type of snowshoe ever invented? Actually, the first snowshoe ever invented was just a wooden plank strapped onto the user's feet about four to 6,000 years ago in Asia. And there were two different camps. One group migrated into Scandinavia, and they ultimately developed the ski. The other group migrated into Alaska, and they developed the snowshoe. And some of the more modern innovative designs are the pivoting binding, the lightweight materials, and these metal cleats on the bottom. The cleats really help the snowshoe dig into the hard, icy snow. And the size, look at the difference. Yeah, big size difference. Now, how do you know which is the right size to choose? Well, it depends. A big guy like you is gonna need a much bigger snowshoe than a small person like me. Is that because I have big feet? No, it's more a factor of your weight. You need a bigger snowshoe to help dissipate your weight across the snow surface. And they're actually starting to come out with snowshoes for women now. These are lighter, more narrow, and they accommodate a woman's stride much better. I guess the right equipment really can make the difference. It sure does. What do you say we pack up our packs, strap on our snowshoes, and head out into the backcountry? Sounds good. All right. These snowshoes are pretty easy to maneuver in. You got any special tips I should know? Well, the greatest thing about snowshoeing is that it's really natural. I mean, it's gotta be one of the easiest winter sports to learn. However, there are two tips I can give you. The first one is, don't ever try to walk backwards. These aren't designed to go backwards. You're gonna step back, get them caught in the snow, and it'll send you to the ground. So, if you ever do need to turn around and go backwards, you can do the quick kick turn, and a lot of skiers do this, and it's really easy on snowshoes, too. You just put both ski poles behind you, lift one foot up, and turn it 180 degrees. Then you're going to weight that foot and turn right around. Boom, you're going the opposite direction. Well, that seems easy enough. Great, Brian, you're looking good. You know, I'm really amazed at how tough it is to push through this hard, crunchy snow. I know, it is hard, isn't it? Well, we've just come off the summit at 9,000 feet up there, and this slope we're crossing, it faces west. So that means it's getting hit real hard by both the sun and the wind. And that's what makes this breakable crust we're dealing with here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a few techniques I can give you for crossing this slope. 
first one is you really want to make sure the teeth on your snowshoes are biting real good into the crust there. Okay. Yeah, that'll really help dig in there so you don't go sliding down the slope. The other thing is you want to make sure your snowshoe is ho as horizontal to the slope as possible. You mean that'll like this? Really, yeah. Okay. Really dig it in there. That'll help with your stability. Okay. And the other thing is you want to make sure you've got three points into the snow at all times before you take your next step. Right. Exactly. Don't worry, Ryan, though. It's going to get a lot easier for you from here on. We're just going to head straight down in here. I like the sound of that. Sure, what do I got to do? Well, you just got to work a little harder, that's all. Just pick your feet up real high and that'll keep you from getting tripped up. Okay. I'm feeling pretty good, but I'll tell you what, this breaking trail is tough work. I know, it is. That's why we'll want to switch out leads frequently. Exhaustion and dehydration can be a pretty serious problem in the wintertime. We'll want to make sure we keep our energy levels up and make sure we're drinking a lot of water throughout the day. I know, it's always easy to remember to drink water in the summertime when you're all hot and sweaty. I know, it is. It's hard to drink water in the wintertime. But pe being well hydrated is going to make sure we ward off that real common winter ailment known as hypothermia. Oh, yeah, that's when your, what, your core temperature gets below, what, 98.6 degrees? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a real serious problem. Add a little wind and wet to that, and you could be in an emergency situation. So how do you know if you or someone you're with is getting hypothermia? Well, in the mild cases, the person's just shivering really bad, and they can't warm themselves up. At that point, you just want to try to warm them up as best you can. You give them a hot drink or wrap them up in a sleeping bag. However, if you get into severe cases, you don't want to warm that person up. At that point, you're calling the helicopter and initiating an evacuation. If you warm somebody up too fast, you could cause a heart attack. I guess the hypothermia is nothing to fool around with. No, it's definitely could be a real serious problem. But it's not as serious as that other thing we could be facing out here. Yeah, what's that? Avalanches. Oh, yeah, that's right. Take a look at that slope up there, Brian. That's an avalanche slope. We actually had a big one here a few years ago. Yeah, what happened? Well, there was a group of people out here, and a couple of them went out to cross that slope. They triggered a slab avalanche. They were carried down the hill, buried, and killed. The tragic thing about it is that these kind of accidents can be prevented. Yeah, I can see how the snow can really get built up on that ridge line by the wind. Yeah, um, whenever you're out in the backcountry, you're going to find conditions and hazards that you wouldn't normally encounter on well-established trails. There's really no substitute for getting out there and really examining the environment. I guess you always have to be observant when you're in the backcountry. You do, especially when it comes to avalanches. You really want to know what you're getting into. Basically, there's two types of avalanches. One is called a point release, and this is one that starts at one point up on the top, slides down the slope, gaining momentum as it goes. The other is called the slab avalanche, and this is where one big cohesive layer of snow breaks off, goes rocketing down the slope about 60 miles per hour. 
These can be the most deadly and dangerous of all avalanches. So what causes an avalanche? Is it a, your voice or what? No, that's actually a really common myth. Noise cannot trigger an avalanche. It's basically an unstable snowpack. In a stable snowpack, the strength of the snow exceeds the stresses put upon it. So in order for an avalanche to occur, there needs to be something that upsets that balance. Are there guidelines for that? There are. There are three major variables to consider. The weather, the snowpack, and the terrain. This is what's known as the avalanche triangle. Today, the weather seems to be in our favor for crossing this slope here, but I'd like to take a closer look at the snowpack, um, especially since the slope has slid in the past. What do you say we head out onto the slope and do a couple stability tests? OK. Hey, Brian, would you mind handing me that slope meter behind you? Sure. Whenever you're digging a snow pit, you want to make sure that the slope is steep enough that it's going to give you some results. So I like to measure it with my slope meter. Looks like we've got about 35 degrees, which is just perfect for getting some good results. OK. So what I've done is I've isolated a column of snow, and I'm going to do the compression test, other, or otherwise known as the tap test. And the idea is to just gradually increase pressure on the column so you can see where and if it fails. And if it does fail, how much pressure it took for it to go. So I'll start out with just easy pressure, 10 taps with, from the wrist. Now I need you to look really carefully. And I want you to, if you see anything, little micro fissures, or if you see the snowpack fail anywhere, just let me know right away. OK. So one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nothing okay. yet. Okay. Didn't fail on easy. Let's go up to moderate. Okay. That'll be ten taps from the elbow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <gasps> At seven, you created this line here. At 10, you created this shear here. Okay, so we got some failures at the moderate level. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's a pretty clean shear there. That's not a really good sign for us. Let's take it, check this one out. Ooh, that's uh, a real clean shear. Yeah, it is. You don't want a big, this snow is acting like a slab. You don't want this coming down on top of you. And while, you know, there are several other tests you can do to determine avalanche stability, these shears that we're getting are giving us a pretty obvious sign that things are not very stable right now. So instead of crossing the slope, I think it might be better to go up and around. We can travel on the ridges and keep ourselves out of avalanche danger. OK. Sounds good? Yeah. All right, let's pack up and go. Well, Brian, looks like this is the last big downhill we're going to see today. Oh, yeah, this looks pretty fun. Yeah, going down on snowshoes is usually one of two things, either really fun or kind of scary. It's always exhilarating, though. Oh, yeah. You want to race? <laughs> well, sure, I'm not too worried about it. There's plenty of soft snow to cushion us if we should fall. But now, there's a couple of ways you can go downhill on snowshoes. One is you can just run. You just really got to pick your feet up real high so you don't get tripped up in the snow. And then, if conditions permit, you can kind of lengthen your stride and get a little bit of a slide in with every step. Kind of, kind of like sliding on ice. Exactly, yeah. And then if you really want to go for it, you just pick up your heels and get those little crampons up out of the snow and just slide on down. 
Of course, you'll be totally out of control, but that's part of the fun, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, now always remember, safety first. You want to make sure your feet are about shoulder width apart, because if you start stepping on your snowshoes, that's a recipe for a face plant. Well, I'll try not to do that. OK, you got it? Yeah. Go. Ooh. That'll get your heart pumping. Yeah, sure will. Nice to be down here on the flatlands. Do you ever see any elk down here in the wintertime? Yeah, this will be the place you'd see them. See, elk move around a lot. They go way up in the mountains in the summertime to keep cool. Then in the winter, they come down into these valleys to band together and keep warm. See any other inhabitants down here? Oh, yeah. The Sawtooth is famous for its wildlife diversity. We've got down here in the lowlands, moose, antelope, deer, and way up in the mountains, we've got bighorn sheep, mountain goat, cougar, bear, and even the rare, rare wolverine. Oh, yeah, plenty of room for them to roam. Yeah, it's this unique combination of designated wilderness, national forest, and national recreation area to make for a lot of prime habitat available to the animals. Didn't they have to reintroduce the wolf into this area a few years back? Yeah, back in 1995, they reintroduced 35 wolves into the wilderness of central Idaho. How are they doing? Well, initially, they were doing really well, but the more recent reports aren't quite as encouraging. They're just an animal that needs so much room. They've had some conflicts with some of their human neighbors. I think there's about 200 in the state right now. That means they're on their way to regaining a stable population in the state of Idaho again. Looks like we're getting close to the river here, Brian. Now, I'm assuming they're calling it the Salmon River because there's salmon in it. That's right. The salmon have been migrating up to these headwaters for thousands of years. Seems like an awfully long trip to make. It is, and it's gotten even longer. Yeah, how come? Well, there's so many dams in the river system right now. A lot of the time, the fish can't make it back up here at all to spawn anymore. So what do they do? Well, the lucky ones, they just try to spawn downstream, but a lot of them just die trying. What about fish ladders? Well, the fish ladders can be effective, but they're not the fix-it-all solution we thought they were going to be. They cost a lot in time and money to construct. A lot of the time, the fish can't get up the ladders. But those that do make it up here in the fall to spawn. And then in the spring, the little smolts hatch out and make their way back down to the ocean. Now, does the Salmon River run directly to the Pacific? No, not directly. The salmon runs into the snake right on the Oregon border. And then that heads north up into Washington, where it joins the Columbia. Columbia comes back down into Oregon and empties out into the Pacific. Still seems like an awfully long trip to make. Isn't it amazing? Everything about these mountains is amazing. Well, Brian, welcome to the River of No Return, otherwise known as the Salmon River. Oh, it's beautiful up here. Isn't it, though? I don't know about you, but all this water's making me thirsty. I think I'm going to take a little break and do some hydrating. How about you? I'll catch up with you in just a minute. Up here where the peaks are high and white and the melting snow gives life to the Salmon River, it feels like we're a 1,000 miles from anywhere. 
Those are the rewards of snowshoeing. Whether you're going out for just a few hours or a few days, it feels like you're breaking new ground for the first time. I'd like to thank Francie for an amazing look at the Sawtooth Mountains. We've got a bit of country between us and a warm fire, but we'll see you on the next trail side. Nothing saps the fun out of sleeping outdoors like the cold, but it doesn't need to slow you down. Before you get into bed, do a little physical activity to help rev your body up and then bring all that warmth into your sleeping bag. And also, put your next day's socks and underwear into the bottom of your sleeping bag so they'll be toasty warm in the morning. To order home videos of this or any other Trailside program or to order a Trailside guidebook, call 1-800-TRAILSIDE.